this video, we're going to be looking at hooking up the scope to get primary ignition waveforms. Uh, in this case, voltage is what we're looking at, as well as secondary. And we're also going to be analyzing the primary ignition waveform and all its fine points. First off, we'll take a look under the hood and check out and see what a connection actually looks like so that when we make it back to the shop, we can get hooked up on the car and we know where all the places we should hook up the scope are. So we're here under the hood. I picked a car that has some pretty easily identifiable components for hooking this up. Um, we have our ignition coil. We have a positive terminal and a negative terminal, secondary terminal, right? distributor cap, plug, wires, all that happy stuff. Now you can see, when you look at that lower terminal, you'll see where that clamp is connected. And that is on the negative side of the coil. We're gonna hook up because that's the switching side. We're gonna hook up on the negative side. If we hook up on the positive side, all we're gonna see is a straight line. So our primary voltage hookup is a standard scope setup. We have put an attenuator in that line this is a 10 to 1 attenuator. The job of the attenuator is to take the voltage down. In this case, it's a 10 to 1 attenuator. It's going to take the voltage down by a factor of 10 or 1 tenth. So off of this coil, we're going to produce between 350 and 400 volt kick when we turn the switch off. And so when that happens, that induced voltage will be traveling through the system, but our scope is only set up to read at a maximum of about 200 volts. So it's not going to like that 350 volt kick. So we put the 10 to 1 attenuator in there. So the scope, instead of 350, we'll see 35 volts, much more in its normal realm. The other thing I'm going to do, I have secondary pickups. Not only are we going to look at the ignition primary, we're going to go ahead and take a peek into the world of ignition secondary. Again, this is an easy car to do that on. I have secondary leads. It's going to clamp to a good ground. And then I have a lead that's going to go around a plug wire. Or most specifically, my first lead is going to go around the wire for the ignition coil. Right there. And then I'm going to take a second lead. And I'm going to add that second lead, clip to ground. And I'm going to go ahead and go around the plug wire that goes to number one cylinder. Now I'm going to do that, and we'll see that when we look over the waveforms. But by adding that to the plug wire that goes to number one cylinder, that's going to allow me to synchronize my ignition pattern. I'm going to get all eight firing events on the primary. I'm going to get all eight firing events on the secondary lead that I have hooked to the coil wire. But by triggering off of the number one cylinder, I can look in firing order and I'll be able to tell which cylinder down the line is which in the firing order so I can keep track of everybody. So that's our basic setup if we want to look at voltage, both primary and secondary, on an ignition system. Now, obviously, other vehicles are going to look different when we do this, but the hookup remains the same. We're going to be on the negative side of the ignition coil. If we have plug wires or access to secondary, then we're going to use an appropriate pickup to get into that. And we'll figure out a way to sync it if we need to. The components will look different. The actual physical hookup remains the same. All right. Now that we know where to hook up on the car, now we're going to talk our way through the waveform so we can analyze what we were looking at. Our scale here, we have zero volts or ground at the bottom. We have 14 volts. I put 14, pretty common system voltage. We should start and end at 14 volts. If we start and end at different places, that means we have connection issues in the circuit. We have problems we need to go looking at. This is specific to the primary waveform. And then my top, not to scale. This line right here, the firing line, that firing line can go upwards of 350 to 400 volts, like discussed when we were on the car hookup. That's why we use the attenuator. So I'm not to scale here. So you're just going to have to deal with that. We start at 14 volts. Then we turn the switch on. 
we close the point contacts, we engage the transistor, whatever we do, we turn that switch on to carry current in the circuit. We're dropping low. Remember, we are looking at this on the negative side of the coil because that's where the switch is being done, which means we have power there until we close that switch, no matter what it is. Then that power should drop to, yeah, near zero. So we have power in, we close the switch. Because we're on the ground side, we see it drop to pretty close to zero. It holds zero. We call that the start of dwell. It holds near zero. Coming along, coming along. Now, there's two different coil designs. We have a current limiting style and a saturated style. I have a current limiting drawn here. The biggest difference would be if it was saturated, you wouldn't see this rise. This line would remain straight and then just shoot up right there. Other than that, everything else is going to be the same. This particular style is current limiting. So we'll use a lower resistance ignition coil and there'll be some electronics somewhere, not in the coil itself, but either in, a, in an ignition control module or a powertrain control module, whatever's running that primary circuit will have some circuitry built into it to limit the current flow. So we're gonna hold near zero and then when current limiting kicks up, you'll see it rise up. You'll notice it doesn't go back to 14. So we have a volt drop here. It's not zero, it's not 14, which means we still have current flowing. Realistically, we've built a magnetic field and now we're gonna flow just enough current to make sure that field maintains its optimal strength till we fire this thing off. Next, the end of dwell, right here. I didn't mark that, but the firing line represents the end of dwell. So this period, right in here, between here and here, we term this time frame dwell or the dwell period. At the end of dwell, our switch turns off or goes open. As you should recall, when that switch opens up, that nice big magnetic field that we made inside the coil collapses down, inducing voltage across the secondary, but also back some back in the primary. That creates our firing line. The height of our firing line can change depending on overall resistance in the circuit. Any gaps we have in this circuit, and I will also mention that while this is a primary waveform, we'll see examples where the primary and secondary waveforms mirror each other. Any gaps in the ignition, an excessive spark plug gap, an excessive, uh, if we have a distributor, an excessive rotor to distributor air gap, any gaps or high resistance, including an open spark plug wire, open and secondary of a coil, will raise this line up. In fact, if we want to test the coil, all we simply do is open up the spark plug wire. We take it off the spark plug. We hold it out in the, in the open for a short period of time. This line will max out. You measure that on your scope. And when we're viewing secondary, you will see what the maximum coil output is. We can't do that on primary. We're going to get around three to 400 volts at the top of this on primary. If we had an open spark plug wire and we're looking at secondary, this line would be way higher. If we have something that causes lower than normal resistance, like a spark plug that got dropped, you'll see this line come down because it doesn't take as much energy to jump all the gaps. Next up, we have the spark line. This is where the spark is actually ionized across the spark plug gap or jumping the plug gap. Our spec tells you this should be from 8 tenths to 2 milliseconds. 8 tenths of a millisecond to 2 milliseconds very short period of time. Realistically, if you're running eight to nine mil tenths of a millisecond in a spark line, everything needs to be perfect inside the cylinder. Typically, if we see less than one millisecond in length right here, that often results in a misfire. 
So we can see something a little bit lower, but everything needs to be perfect. If everything isn't perfect and you're only hitting eight to nine tenths, there's a good chance you're gonna go into a, an ignition misfire in that cylinder. The spark line also moves around and changes and changes how it looks based on resistance, both electrical and mechanical. Uh, if we have a fuel mixture that is very rich, that's actually easy for the electrons to jump the gap or ionize the gap, this line will move down and stay pretty flat. If we have a very lean fuel mixture, it'll rise up and you'll actually see it start to slope up because it's a lot harder to ignite that lean mixture. It has to work harder for the electrons to jump the gap. If we're just holding it out in the open air, there's no compression, there's nothing going on, it's very easy to jump the gap. There's no resistance. Uh, cylinder pressure. So that could either be high compression, low compression, or high cylinder pressure like, you know, everyone's favorite turbocharging or supercharging. If we put a lot of boost into this or have high compression, that's going to raise the demand on the ignition system. You'll see this line come up and it may also raise the line. We have a higher demand. If we have low compression, very low cylinder pressure, you're going to see it as much lower and more stable. You also see turbulence in the cylinder reflected in there. If this line will get very wavy and start moving around, if there's a lot of turbulence going on inside the cylinder. So the spark line can actually tell us a lot about what's going on in there. Temperature changes that. High temperature raises the resistance. Low temperature decreases the resistance and will move that line around and also can change its length. And then at the end, we have coil oscillations. Now, old rule of thumb was you needed a minimum of two to three coil oscillations, but some systems are built so they'll have a minimum number. But we want to see some oscillations back here. As long as we got something going on back there, that tells us that we had energy left over. If we had more energy developed from our ignition coil than we used, we'll have coil oscillations. We didn't use everything. The spark went out before we needed to use it all up and we had excess. We didn't burn it all up, jumping all the gaps. We had plenty to ionize the plug gap and we had some left over. This is what we want. You can think of this, if you're familiar with string theory, you can think of this like string theory. And if you're not, the idea is, think of this as one piece of string. We've taken one piece of string and moved it all out. If something happens like this spark line, or I'm sorry, the firing line gets taller, that pulls this up, that pulls everything from here over this way. This shortens up, we lose some of these. Any change we make to that string has an effect on the rest of this circuit. We want it all nice and balanced out. Couple quick things about coils while we're here and testing them. We have two things going on. If we're looking at the secondary pattern, it's mirrored of this, it looks extremely similar. We can actually tell by watching the firing line what the required voltage of our circuit is. Required voltage is how much it takes to jump all of the gaps and ionize across the spark plug gap. Now we can also take that engine and move it through a variety of loads to get a good idea for what our maximum required voltage is. So the required will be the highest point of the firing line on the secondary waveform. That is different from our available voltage. The available voltage is how much the coil can put out as a maximum. I mentioned it a little bit ago. To get the maximum voltage, what we're gonna do for that is we're going to, if it's coil unplugged, we're gonna take the coil out of the cylinder, we're gonna turn it up to make sure that the spark can't jump anywhere, ensure it's plugged in on the primary side, start the vehicle and make a quick measurement. If it is a uh, distributorless ignition system, DIS, our distributor ignition system where we have plug wires, or even a, a coil near plug. Anywhere of a plug wire, we simply disconnect the plug wire from a spark plug, move it aside where the spark can't jump out of it, and we see where the firing line goes. That gives us an idea of about maximum coil voltage. Now realistically, if we're dealing with a distributor, we really need to pull the wire that comes out of the coil to go to the distributor cap. 
because on a distributor, if we're just down at a spark plug and we pull that, we are gonna use up some energy jumping the gaps down there. Realistically, it shouldn't make that much of a difference. But if you wanna truly be technically correct, distributor, we pull it right out of the coil. Really, if you just pull it at a spark plug, hold it so it can't jump to any metal surface. Make sure you're using some insulated plug pliers for that. These are spark plug wire pliers. I can hang on to the ends. Now they aren't marked as truly insulated, but they actually work really well. If I don't use something like this, then I can get zapped pretty good with some juice. I don't want that. So we pull that wire off, we get our maximum amount on our firing line, and then we get an idea for how much available voltage the coil has. So I hope that gives you a good idea about the basics of what's going on in our firing line. We'll catch you in the next video.